Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight. Our guest today is Lee Elders, the author of Expeditions, Gold, Shamans, and Green Fire. It's his newly published account of his adventures among the Shuwara Indians in the jungles of Ecuador. Lee was born in a railroad house in Bowie, Arizona, and raised on the Apache Reservation near San Carlos, where his pet was a coyote and his mentor was an Apache medicine man. Lee was destined to be an adventurer, and he's traveled the world exploring the unknown. He has an extensive background in investigation, and today he is also recognized as one of the world's premier UFO investigators. So, Lee, adventurer extraordinaire, welcome to New Consciousness Review. Well, thank you. Happy to be here. I have uh, to tell you that um, normally I find the book, I invite the author for the interview, and then I read the book. In your case, I just picked up the book, started reading it, absolutely couldn't put it down, and I figured I'd better invite you onto my show just to take advantage of having read the book already. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, and as I say, I'm very honored to be here today. Well, you know, it's not very often that you read a book with such um, uh, wild adventure, and yet it's all true. I mean, if if I were picking this up, I would swear it was an Indiana Jones film script. You actually lived this. Yes, I did. Um, and, uh, did you re did you record this in diaries, or or how did you? Um, remember all of these events because it's such a beautiful, rich narrative. Uh, I did uh, record uh, diaries. I also, in the early years, in the 60s, I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that I carried with me. And uh, I did some film work, took some photographs. Uh, as you probably noticed, that uh, when I started to write this book, I wound up with 1,200 pages. And, of mm -hmm. course, that was too clumsy, too long, so I edited it down to two separate books. And my my other book will be out hopefully this year, which is uh, continues my adventures in uh, Ecuador. Wow, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you grew up um, alongside an Apache Indian reservation. Was this life what kind of predisposed you to being um, free and, and really uh, a wild man? <laughs> well, definitely, yes. Uh, I grew up in eastern Arizona on the Apache uh, San Carlos Reservation. My grandfather was uh, employed by the Southern Pacific Railway Com Company, and uh, we lived in a railroad house uh, very close to the railroad tracks, and uh, my my buddies, my friends, my my childhood mates were Apache boys, and uh, anyway, at the tender age of seven, eight, nine, I was exploring the dry washes around our house, and I think that's when I really became addicted, and I must say this, I was addicted to adventure, mm -hmm. and later on, uh, as you know, I think that... Uh, the twin of adventure is probably danger. And later on, I would ride with my grandfather on the motor car, which rode the rails. Uh, I would go tag along with him and his crew, and we were always looking into the night or in the around the curve, trying to see if maybe a passenger train or a freight train <laughs> might, have, might have gotten through the dispatcher's net. And, of course, this was exciting to me. It was an adrenaline rush. And uh, I think that's where it all started, was uh, on the San Carlos Apache Reservation. You know, I listen to you with a little bit of sadness, because when you think of how kids are raised today, I mean, even looking back over my childhood, when, when the kids were small, you would shove them out of the door in the morning and then expect them to come back by, by dark. Whereas today they're so domesticated, there's not this 
this um, reliance on your own resources to go out and explore the world. I think we've lost a lot by that, don't you? Oh, I definitely do. Uh, and, of course, the dangers today are much different than they were back then uh, from the standpoint of human nature, standpoint of human beings. You have to be very careful with your children today, especially in the cities. But uh, I do. I think they're robbed of this uh, excitement called adventure. And uh, I was fortunate, or at the time I thought I was unfortunate because of the desolate area we lived in, but today I really look back on those times and I think about how wonderful they were. Uh, I met the, uh, in one of my excursions from the house, I saw a teepee up on a hill. I climbed the hill, went up there, and uh, that's where I met this man who claimed he was the Apache kid. He was a very old Indian, uh, Apache Indian. And he sort of took me under his wing and he taught me things about nature and how to identify, say, a rattlesnake that may have slithered through or a diamondback or perhaps a Gila monster. He taught me a lot of things. And I was very fortunate to meet him because it sort of set me up for my later adventures in South America. Uh, but he was, he was a great guy. I remember him very much. So... What actually took you to South America in the first place? Well, uh, later on I went to live with my mother who uh, was working in Phoenix and uh, I went to school there and I went through the normal process of high school and I went through three years of uh, college, two years at Phoenix College, one year at Arizona State University. And I uh, got to the point I couldn't handle my... Uh, workload versus my school load. So I was looking for a job, and I found a job in mortgage banking, and it was probably the most boring job I ever had in my life, and I yearned for adventure, and I heard about this mining company out of Phoenix that was going to South America to do some alluvial mining in the rivers there. Now, alluvial mining is where you build a platform, you use suction hoses, you have divers that guide the suction hose in the river underwater, and you uh, literally suck up the sand and the gravel and the uh, precious metal if it's there. So I signed on uh, with them as an underwater diver. I had no experience, but they were willing to teach me. So we took off with their crew for South America. And unfortunately, when they got there, they had uh, they were hit with a special tax with all the equipment they were com coming in with. And uh, back then, or I don't know if it's still called that today, but it was referred to as Mordida. And Mordida was nothing more than a payoff to officials <laughs> to get everything through. Mm -hmm. So they, they couldn't comprehend this, so they decided to return to Phoenix. I decided to stay. And that's where my adventure starts. And how old were you at the time? I was just, uh, t I had just turned 30. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, how did you uh, meet the, the uh, people that you eventually went into this adventure with? Uh, I was very lucky. I, I, had, uh, I knew of the river that the mining company was going to. And so I found maps, and I put the maps together, and I decided to go investigate on my own. And I went up there to a little village called Nabon. And up there I met some uh, interesting men who lived in the village. They were very leery of me at first, but uh, as I got to know them, I spent about 30 days up there. They decided to share a secret with me because they felt that I was honest. And I was young and maybe naive, but uh, there was something about me that they felt they could trust. So they told me about this gold-bearing river called Infernelius that was back in the uh, highlands and the jungle uh, in a three-day walk. It took three days to get to it. So I talked to them about it, and they asked me if I was willing to share, and I said, of course. So they took me in to the river called Infernelius, which was translated to Little Hell. 
And so that was my first trip. And uh, we went in. I hired uh, uh, four cargo carriers. And then I hired the two men that had trusted me. And so we had a, like a six, seven man team going in. And we'd planned on uh, setting up camp and probably staying there a week and using bateas. Uh, a bate is what they call, uh, what in the days of old is what the old miners used as a gold pan. But theirs was larger, quite different. But anyway, we got to the river after three grueling days and uh, started uh, washing gold. And uh, I thought, man, this is, this is great. We're going to be rich. But they had warned me that the mountain spirits were very so we say discerning as to who went into the river. And at that time, I, uh, I thought, well, this is a great mess. But later on, I found out that if the mountain spirits did it, it did control the water, uh, the rain, and nature, then I was in a world of hurt. Because overnight, after a couple of days of washing gold, the river flooded, and... Unfortunately, we had put our base camp on the opposite side of the river on high ground, which was fortunate when the river flooded, but it was unfortunate because we couldn't cross the river to get back to the bone. So we were stranded, and our food supplies were dwindling, our water supply, and uh, eventually uh, a strange thing had happened while we were going in on the trail this strange dog sort of joined their crew. And none of the Indians knew where he'd, he was from or anything about him. But uh, he reminded me of my pet coyote that I had back in San Carlos. And so it took a while to tame him and get him to eat from my hand. Eventually he was sleeping in the same tent with me. But anyway, he was responsible for finding a log jam upriver that we we literally could cross back to safety. So mm. that was my first adventure at Little Hell. Now, you talk about the the spirits of the forest. Um, it, was it your upbringing? Was it your introduction through your Apache mentor that kind of introduced you to the world of spirits? Well, when I met the Apache mentor, it was, it was funny... Uh, Apparently, he was observing me uh, during my explorations down below in the valley. And he mentioned, he says, where is your spirit dog today? And he was referring to Lobo, the pet coyote that I had that I was raising. And he told me about the Indian legend. He had married a woman from the coyote clan. And he said that a lot of Apaches feel that the... uh, uh, the uh, dog, uh, coyote, is uh, a prankster and nothing more. But he says, I come to know one. I raised one. They're very intelligent, and they, beca- and they can become your spirit dog. So he taught me about the spirits that the uh, Apaches revered. And then I had another experience growing up, too. My grandmother who was always hauling me off to some revival somewhere. She was a a born-again, Bible-thumping Christian, and I would witness her in many of the revivals. She'd jump to her feet, and she'd start speaking in an unknown tongue uh, of a language I'd never heard before. In the beginning, that scared me. I was frightened of it. But then I noticed that other people in the congregation were doing the same thing. And she said that it was the Holy Spirit coming through her. And that's what they believed. Well, it frightened me at first, but then I adapted to it. And it was no longer frightening. So I think that was my first uh, experience with an unknown force or an unknown spirit. Mm. Well... That's an interesting theme in your book, actually, that we'll come back to, which was the similarity uh, and dissimilarity between the sort of Christian spirit and the nature spirits. But ah, 
I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Okay. So, <laughs> let's go back to Little Hell. So there you were crossing back over this log jam. Were you able to uh, make it out with your gold? Oh, yes, yes. We had filled two coffee cans full of uh, primarily gold nuggets. Uh, everything the Indians had told me about the river was true. Uh, it was abundant in gold placer. Anyway, we made it out. We got to Nabone. I finally returned to the port city of Guayaquil. I sold my poke. I sent them a telegram, coded, that uh, I had sold the property and I would be in, be back soon with their share. In the meantime, I placed a call to Yuma, Arizona, a friend of mine in Yuma, uh, Bob Olson, and I invited him to come down. Now, Bob was a uh, a builder. He had his own construction company. He knew equipment. He flew his own airplane. Very brilliant guy. And he was yearning for adventure, so he joined me in Waikil. So I brought him in so we could build our own dredge and take it back to Little Hell. And we did. We built a four-incher out of spare parts and anything we could find in Waikil. And we started back to Little Hell. I paid the Indians in Sabone, in the bone. And uh, it was a process of time. This took over two weeks for me, for me to find cargo carriers. So we <clears throat> figured we'd need probably at least 60 or 70 able-bodied men to carry the dredge, the gasoline for the dredge, all the food supplies, the tents everything we needed uh, for staying power there. And so finally, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to need some help, and I need a good translator. And luck was with me. I found Adriano Ventamilla, who was studying at the Justice Department, uh, or working at the Justice Department. He was in college studying law, international law. He spoke five languages. And he became a good friend of ours, so he decided to work with us under one condition. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, I want to check out all these men you're hiring to make sure they're honest, to make sure there's no criminals there. So I said, okay. <clears throat> so in the process of checking out the 78 names that I had for cargo carriers, he found three that were wanted criminals. One was a horse thief. I thought, well, that's not too bad out here. You know, we're actually in the Wild West out here. But he said, no, if he stole a horse, he might steal your goal. And so that was his pragmatic approach to things. But there were two others that uh, were really bad hombres. So he says, uh, I'll go with you. But he says, we've got to fire these men, get rid of them. Well, I knew we were going to have problems when we did that. But anyway, he did fire the three. And uh, to make a long story short, we took off with the rest of the cargo carriers. We left for a three-day journey. And uh, we had camped at a lagoon. And one of the men that had been fired had uh, literally penetrated the workforce. We didn't know he was there. And he... Uh, took uh, lagoon water, which is loaded with sulfur, put it in our drinking water, and about halfway to Little Hell, everybody came down seriously ill, except mm -hmm. myself and a few others. And uh, so that halted the expedition at that point. Then mm -hmm. I had to return back to Nabone to find horses and to come back and rescue them. Bob and the rest of the men that had been uh, tainted with this water. So the second trip to hell was a failure. And it was a failure primarily because of betrayal on mm -hmm. betrayal. One of the things that impresses me uh, in the book is the incredible hardships, the, the incredible danger that you faced going into the jungle each time. Give us a flavor of that. Well, the first danger we first was getting, uh, we 
literally were concerned about was getting there. The only way we could uh, get into this jungle outpost that we had to go to, to go upriver to search for the emeralds we were looking for, was uh, by air. And we had, uh, we had a charter flight on several occasions. Uh, the first charter flight that was uh, designated to take me in, I was in Guayaquil. I tried to get back the next day to catch it with my men to go in. I couldn't get a flight out of Guayaquil. And the charter uh, company, uh, they abandoned us, and they took four more explorers to fly them into the area. Well, the plane was never heard from again. Uh, friends of mine who thought I was on the plane thought I'd gone down with it. They were calling me, but uh, I was safe. So in the back of my mind was the flight itself. Later, we would take DC-3s and fly with the, those pilots in. So once we got in there, okay, and getting in there was a concern because of the weather problems. But once we got in, then we uh, would... Uh, head up river searching for certain landmarks and uh, trying to follow landmarks I don't I don't think you introduced the the notion of the the will um, and oh, the emerald yeah. search so uh, tell our readers about that okay uh, after little hell I'd returned to the states and I thought well uh, <clears throat> betrayal really cut me deep because I felt I was helping the village on what we were doing there, and yet I was betrayed by several people living in the village. And I was having a hard time getting over that, and I thought, well, Ecuador is out of the equation. Then one day I received a letter from Adriano Ventimiglia, uh, the man that was working with us, our translator and good friend, and he told me about this new find that a friend of his I had run into a woman in the jungle up in the Marcus Forest with two children that was searching for her family's legacy. And it was a lost emerald mine that her great-grandfather had discovered in 1881. And she had this last will and testament with her, which was bound in a hardback book. And she had run out of food and supplies, so this uh, man... Alfredo Beresuata, <clears throat> he gave her money. He helped her come back to Cuenca. And at that point, he told Adriano about this story and the last will and testament. Adriano read the book, or the will itself. He did some research into it. He found out that a local priest had been up on that river many years earlier and had found a white matrix, uh, matrix rock about the size of a basketball that was loaded with emeralds. And so the story started to check out. So he sent me this letter and he said, Lee, you've got to come back. And he says, if this story is true and we can find this emerald deposit, it will probably reshape the economics and the political structure of my country. He says, it's going to be a daunting challenge, but... Uh, I think we can do it. So that letter, of course, was all I needed <laughs> to head back to Ecuador. So I went back, and at that point, we started uh, uh, planning, plotting how we would go about doing this. And, of course, it would require expeditions in to search for the treasure. <clears throat> and it sounded easy. You know, you thought, well, you're going to follow a river. We're going to be looking for a rock open in the middle is where he had hid part of his treasure. And it should be easy. But once you get into, especially the Marcus Forest, I mean, it's just unbelievably thick with all types of vegetation, all types of trees. You have to chop and clear your way. You have to chop trails. You're up and down because it's mountainous in the area. And it just uh, saps your strength, it saps your willpower. The beauty of the jungle is one thing, but the other side, the hidden face of the jungle is something else because you have all the predators in there, uh, the, 
the big jaguars. You have pumas, you have black bears, but you have enormous amount of snakes, different types uh, of snakes. Some are aggressive, some are non-aggressive. So <clears throat> you're always at wit wit's end, more or less, to uh, make sure that you're protected, make sure that your health is okay, because other than the predators, you have the bacteria problem, the fungus problem, and the amoeba problem. Uh, the amoebas uh, fester in the water there, and if you don't happen to, or if you forget to boil water to uh, take care of your uh, eating utensils, for example, when you clean those, then you can get the amoeba strain, which I did in 1974 on my second trip. I got a real bad case of not only amoebas, but malaria. Mm -hmm. But early on, if I've answered your question uh, correctly, uh, it's just imposing. Uh, the jungle is just so imposing. Yeah. Now, you met a very interesting uh, shaman by the name of Antonio Necta. Tell us about him. Well, Antonio Necta, he... He, uh, we found out that we had to cross his land to go further up the river, up the Rio Tutanagosa. And uh, we sent an expeditionary force then in the beginning because uh, anyone outside of uh, the Indians of the Shuara are considered colonials. And that includes, uh, some Indians refer to Americans as white, the white men. But uh, the Shuara referred to Americans as colonials. They referred to them as uh, uh, even the Quincanos were referred to as colonials. <clears throat> so we knew that we were being, going to be watched. So we sent in an expeditionary force. And on their way, they ran into, luckily ran into Antonio's brother-in-law. And they were getting ready to cross his land. And Jesus says, no, you have to get permission from Antonio Necta. He owns this land. So anyway, it took a while to get Antonio. We left money there for him to fly into uh, Cuenca. Finally, he did. We met him. And uh, he was a very mysterious type of man. He had, in my opinion, two faces. One face was which he gave to you in the meeting, your first meetings with him, which is very quiet, very subdued but almost like he knew something that you didn't know and you were dying to find out what it was, but he wasn't going to tell you until he became your friend. <clears throat> Eventually, we became friends, and I asked him to be my point man. And uh, it was during that initial meeting with him that uh, I found out that he was an Uwissan, a Pener Uwissen. Uwissen is a shaman who deals with curing people, animals and people. And they use uh, they use their tribal uh, tribal ways uh, to induce this uh, curing. But they also use uh, pharmaceuticals from the jungle. And I found that quite interesting. And so after he left our first visit, I did some research on Uwissens and shamans, and I found out that uh, there were three types. There was a Pinner Uwissen uh, who cured and was helpful to people. There was the Wawek who was uh, <clears throat> just the opposite, who liked to cast spells, use black magic, use their form of magic to create havoc. And the third most prestigious position in the Shuara tribe was the Kakarma. They were the natural killers. <clears throat> they went on killing raids to avenge families who lost loved ones and friends to other Shuara tribes deep in the interior. So I was quite thankful that I'd run into... <laughs> the right <Yeah>. kind. <laughs> <laughs> the right kind, yeah. Now, the, the Shuara were actually not very long uh, previous to, to your meeting up with them. 
um, headhunters, uh, complete with, you know, shrunken heads. Tell us about that. Well, they were still practicing in the interior when I was there. And even today, I think the further you go into the interior, I think they still take uh, what they call tansa, uh, which is uh, shrunken heads. And uh, the Unta Shuara that I was working with had pretty, pretty much foregone that. Uh, the Catholic Church had missions in the area. They were still heavily involved in their tribal traditions, but they were no longer taking heads in the part of the region I was in. But the further you went in, yes, they still were. And the reason they did this is because in battle, uh, the Untashuara, they were always fighting the Ashuaras. The Ashuaras lived uh, in the interior. And when they captured or killed someone, they would sever the head, they would sew the lips shut, and this was to capture their soul. They felt the more souls they had for their private army, the more of a killer they were, the more protection they had. So this was the main reason that shrunken head, uh, shrinking head started and the shrunken head problem with the Shuaras. Later on, I think they would uh, shrink heads and sell them to tourists uh, <laughs> along the river. Uh, and, of course, that was forbidden, and you could get arrested if you tried to buy one. But I've heard of people going up there that did buy them. Uh -huh. So it was, a, it was a symbol of power to take a head, to sew the lip shut, to capture the soul. Did you get any insight into the role of the Catholic missionaries and how the Catholic religion kind of interplayed with the native beliefs? Uh, it was totally opposite of the native belief. In fact, the, the Shuara, uh, they didn't have a deity per se. They had a, uh, they called it a garden helper. She was a goddess that helped them raise their plants and their food supplies in their garden. I heard of her. And then they had uh, the god, if you wanted to call it a god, of shamanism, because they were so involved in all these shamanistic events. And this god was a shapeshifter. He could uh, sh uh, shift himself into becoming a boa or becoming a, a bird. Anyway, the Indians revered but feared him. But as far as salvation, having a God of salvation to give them eternal life or anything like that. No, they did not. I think this is why the Catholic Church and the missionaries were so successful of recruiting and uh, bringing so many into their fold was the fact I think some of the uh, Shuar at that point were ready for it. I know that they were ready for the conveniences that were making their way into Sakua sewing machines, transistor radios, things of this nature, things that would help them better their lives and their children's lives. I know that the schools were set up in Sakua, and the children could use their own native language, but they were taught also Spanish. So I think this really affected a lot of the Shuara who had open minds, and uh, they were converting to Christianity and they were going more into the white man ways. Mm -hmm. But in the interior, it was a different story. The Ashawara and the Morellis tribe, they didn't trust outsiders, especially uh, colonials. And they were at war not only with other Shawara tribes, but also with the colonials. Uh, and even today, I think many of them have not been domesticated. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that uh, you had hired people to help you, hired locals to help you, and yet there was a tension between the locals and the indigenous Indians, the Shuara. Um, the, the locals looked down upon them. Um, why, why do you think that was so? 
Well, uh, the Kanyari Indians who I worked with at Little Hell, uh, they feared the Shuar. Mm -hmm. uh, the Shuar, uh, or what the Western world called the Hivero, the Hivero was a, it was a savage tribe. When the Incas came in to conquer that part of Ecuador, which they conquered the highlands, but they sent their parties into Shuar uh, land, and the Shuar just uh, decimated the Incas. Uh, the Incas had never seen blowguns before, dipped in uh, curare poison. Uh, the, the Shuar were so brave and killed so many Inca, the Inca finally moved out of their territory. Later, when they tried to, Inca tried to domesticate the, uh, or bring the Canari Indians into their fold, they had the same problem, except the Canaries and the Incas fought in huge battles, battles that would claim 50, 60,000 men's lives mm -hmm. in a week, and they're only using rock spears and that type of thing. But the Canary Indians that I hired from Cuenca to go in and be a part of my expedition, they were scared to death of the Shuar. Mm -hmm. And the Shuar knew this. And because of this, they frowned upon them. They didn't care for them. Uh, so there was this uh, tribal hierarchy, you might call it, uh, between the Shuar, the Canary, the Yumblos, and, and some of the other Indians. But the Shuara had a real bad reputation as fighters. Uh -huh. Now, uh, one of the light motifs in the book is the um, really almost supernatural nature of the jungle, the spirits, the um, uh, energies, I guess, that reigned within the jungle. Did you find the Shuara's connection to nature different from the Indians? Uh, from the other Indians? Oh, the from the, Indians. yeah. Yeah. The Shuara believed that uh, everything had a soul, even a rock. They believed that that was a part of the harmony of the jungle. I mean, they were jungle dwellers. Uh, they knew the jungle. They had uh, <clears throat> seen the what they call the forest guardians. But one thing about the Shuara that enhanced their belief and enhanced their reputation was they would take uh, ayahuasca. At the time, an ayahuasca is a hallucinatory drug. Uh, back when I was there, uh, scientists hadn't even broke down all the properties yet. But uh, they would take this, uh, what was called ayahuasca, which was grown wild in the jungle. They would use it in their ceremonies. And the early uh, young men had to go through the manhood uh, rituals, and they had to take ayahuasca. And when they started to hallucinate and get in touch with their soul or get in touch with the jungle spirits, they had to go out and touch the magical jaguar to prove their manhood. So I heard all of these stories. I was offered ayahuasca, but I, I didn't want to take it, and I never took it. But uh, a lot of their experiences was under, under hallucinatory-type uh, drugs. But still, they had the tribal legends to, as well. They revered the, the jaguar and the jaguar energy. And they also spoke of a place back in there, deep up where we were going, as the city of magicians. And they were in constant uh, in touch, either stoned or straight, with the supernatural in their area. And there was a lot of it. It was good and there was bad. Mm. Did you experience, uh, or tell, I know you did, tell us about some of the supernatural events that you experienced directly. Oh, <clears throat> I remember... Uh, this was later on, after we'd gotten comfortable with the jungle, we'd worked our way up, we'd crossed various rivers. Uh, we were in the area that uh, we felt Mejia was talking about because we had found an old Indian that uh, he was over 100 years old, and he was working with my shaman friend, and he told us the name of the river 
the actual name before the Colombians changed the name. Mejia was a Colombian, by the way. And uh, we were up there, and, and uh, I had this young Indian with me named Ambusha. And Ambusha had explored that area in the past. But he told us, he said he would not go in there with us, and we, need him. we needed him as a guide. But he would not go across this river into what was called the Kyanade unless he consulted with the spirits first. And he would do so that evening. And the next morning, I was tense, waiting for him to say, no, he's, we're not going. But he said, yeah. He said, they are allowing us to go. But we can only take four with us. So all of a sudden, I have spirit numerology occurring on my expedition. And you were and five I, at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and we, there was five of us, yes. So that meant one of us had to stay back. So uh, Nectar came up front. He was talking to Ambusha, and they got into a heated argument. And Ambusha says, no, Nectar, you cannot make, the, make that decision. The spirits have to. So we said, okay, how long is this going to take? Well, the next morning, the youngest member of our team came down with flu-like symptoms, very ill, so he couldn't go. He had to stay. So now we had four. So that's, uh, now I'm starting to think, well, okay, there is something to all of this. Not that I didn't believe it, but, you know, seeing is believing. So we worked our way up, uh, and we crossed a river called the Kansar. And we were in Kyanade uh, number two. There were two Kyanades up there. And uh, again, Ambush has said, the spirits will not allow us to spend the night here on this river in Kyanade Dos, he called it. So I said, okay, we'll make our base camp back there. We'll push in as far as we can during a half a day and then work back to the camp. So he was comfortable with that. Well, on the second or third day, I don't recall right now, but we had worked our way too far in, and there's no way we could get back to our camp before nightfall. So here we were, trapped in Kyanade number two, which the spirits told him under no circumstances could we spend the night there. And here we were, trapped. And, and also, one of your members had injured his leg. Oh, yeah. He had had a gash in his leg from a fall. <clears throat> but anyway, we calmed uh, Ambusha down. But he said, we asked him, why can't we spend the night there? And he says, well, the Niawas, that's what they call the jaguar, Niawa, N-I-A-W-A. He says, the Niawas, they are hungry at night, so we don't want to stay in there. And also... Uh, and we found out there'd be a power dance, and that was the name of this chapter, between the good spirits and the bad spirits to determine our fate for ignoring their warning. So that night we hunkered down, and believe me, it was a terrible, terrible evening. Uh, Singabusha was frightened out of his mind. I wasn't too far behind him. The man with the gash in his leg, he was sort of in and out of consciousness. But we had built a firewall. We had found a, a small cave in a ledge near the river. So we decided to defend our, our position out of this cave. And so we stacked firewood around it in case uh, we had to burn fire at night to keep anything out. And we sat there and waited. And I was told by Nectar that I asked him, I said, are we... Is this uh, extension or subconscious, or is this really is this really happening? He says it's as real as you and I. And he says they'll come for us after the light of the first moon. And that night the moon came out, and we heard this whistling sound. It's whistling sounds above us, behind us, all around us. And the Indians immediately said that it was Virtus lordus, which is a parrot snake. It's deadly poisonous. It's like a viper. And it lives in the trees. And it, att it attacks nesting birds uh, that are in the trees at night. And so here we are in the midst of a 
feeding frenzy of snakes and birds that are being killed. And so we had to light the fire because the snakes were everywhere. And we lit the fire. And, of course, the worst enemy of the snake is fire or smoke. So the smoke got to them, and they backed away, and they got, got out of the trees, left us alone. And I thought the worst was over, but it was just starting. And that's when I saw across the river these diffused balls of light that were literally floating, and they were floating up to the river bank across from us. And Nectar told me that they were energy balls and not to be afraid because the forest gardens use them to take care of the forest. And I said, okay. And I watched them, and they disappeared. Then later, we saw these four, which I think today were Niawas, but it was dark. But we could see the eyes. And uh, they made their way up to the river. And all of a sudden, they just stopped, and they left. And so these supernatural experiences, very real to the Indians, mm -hmm. frightening to me. But I found out one thing during that experience. The worst thing you can do is let fear overcome you because fear attracts. So I started thinking in humor and I started, I, was, I talked to the man that was, you know, with the gash leg and he kept saying, Senior Lee, what is it? What is it? So I told him they were fairies. <laughs> and he, and uh, he said, oh, fairies, yes because everybody had seen fairies in their gardens and these sort of things. So it relieved his fear, relieved my fear. And at that point, I felt comfortable. And I felt like we were okay. And we were. The next morning, we stumbled out, went back to civilization. Now, you had a kind of conversion from uh, gold hunter, emerald hunter, to uh, uh, particularly on this last expedition that you described, to coming back to help your friend. What was the um, relationship that you felt between yourself and the spirits at this time? Well, um, let me start at the beginning on how I had been out of Ecuador, uh, I think it was 26 years. Uh, I know it wasn't that long, but anyway, I'd returned to civilization. I had married, had a family, career moves, all of that. Ecuador was the farthest thing from my mind. And then I started these dreams uh, that would come on at night. And in the dream, uh, first they were wispy images, then they were accompanied by sound. They were so vivid, I'd wake up and go down and get a cup of coffee and try to interpret them. But it was Antonio Nectar, and in the dream, he was begging me, please come back. I need you here. You're the only one that's left. All the others are gone. I'm in trouble. Please help me. Well, with that, dream state, and I talked to Britt, my wife, about it, her son, Brett, and I said, I'm going to have to go back. He needs my help. And it was only the right thing to do because he had been my point man on so many expeditions. He had risked his life uh, many occasions for me. So I felt the least I could do was go back and help him. And so I went back to Ecuador. And I had no plans for an expedition, but I felt I should take a weapon in. So I bought a Mossberg shotgun. I bought double out shells for it. Now the trick was smuggling it through U.S. Customs. <laughs> I, I think we will kind of gloss over how you were a gun runner, um, but but let's just cut to the the last scene because um, it was like um, this Antonio um, lost his uh, identity or, or got confused in his identity. And it's really the spiritual crossover that I found um, a, a poignant coda to the book. Uh, yes, uh, that's true. After I returned, I was told by Seuss when I went over there, Antonio has lost his uh, 
the light in his eyes and you must help him. So when I met Antonio, I, I saw that he was a shell of a man. He told me he was being watched by the Federation, the tribe. He told me his life was in danger, all of this. So I said, okay, fine. Uh, let's see what it is. So he said, but I want to take you back up to the Emerald area. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I figured on this expedition, I'd get to know and find out what was wrong with it. In the process of going up there, which is a long story in my book, I'll cut to the chase here. <clears throat> we were camped one night after we'd been up there, and I found out that he was just, uh, I didn't know if he had lost his memory or if he was paranoid or if he was just getting old and he was tired and he felt it was time to leave. <clears throat> but he was a shell of a man I once knew. And that night I, I was sitting outside the tent and he came up to me and he asked me if I believed in the Bible. And I said, yes, I believe in the Bible. He says, good. He says, do you believe I'll have a mansion over there? after I die. Well, that was my grandmother's belief, and I said, yes, I believe that people will have what they want after they die. And he said, thank you very much. He patted me on the shoulder, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Later I found out that Nekta had left his tribal traditions and been converted, became a Christian, and because of that, uh, perhaps an old adversary an old Wawik, someone he fought with in the past with magic, saw this or detected this and was after him to hurt him or kill him. Mm. So at that point is when I knew my return trip was much more important than once again searching for emeralds or anything like that. It was to help a friend in need. And at that point, I really got in touch with myself. And I felt, if you want to label spirituality, I felt I was really involved in a spiritual attempt to help someone, and including myself. And it really changed my life forever, because when I left there, I had no regrets. Even though I was pretty sure I knew where the emeralds were, I felt like I just couldn't go through with it anymore. I didn't want to bring <clears throat> any degradate segregation into the Shuara tribe mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. knew once a discovery was made their lives would change forever I saw it happen around gold bearing rivers in the past where camps sprung up yeah, yeah. and then you had the bottom feeders come in so if this answers your question it does indeed Lee thank you tell me uh, is there a website for the book or what is your website Oh, yeah, it's, it's www.leeelders.com. Uh-huh. Well, we, we have been on an adventure with Lee Elders, the author of Expeditions, Gold, Shamans, and Green Fire. Lee, thank you so much, and I look forward to reading about the continuation of your adventures. Thank you, Miriam. Happy to be here today.